good morning. Good to see all of you. Thank you for being here. I want to welcome those who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joe. I'm the lead pastor here. On behalf of the church, I want to welcome you uh, to our live stream service. Also, to all of you guests in the room, thank you for joining us this morning. It's really fun to get to be here with you today and know that we've got another crowd like you right across the hall right now in our modern venue where Ryan Russell, our teaching and young adult pastor, is teaching over there right now. And we teach from the same um, theme, the same series, the same uh, text of scripture that we look at. We just happen to write our each individual sermons for the room we're talking to. And so today I'm, I'm just really glad to get to be with you today. We've been talking about how everybody counts. You count. Now, the world in which we live, the culture that we experience, it's part of the human experience of our lives, and maybe this is true also uh, specifically even at your work, uh, maybe even in your neighborhood, uh, gosh, maybe even in some of your extended family experiences, and I wish it weren't true, but maybe even here at church at First Temple, it may be that what you hear is sounds more like this, you count if, or you count when. But God says, you count, period. And that's what we're looking at in this series. And last week, Ryan uh, was in here teaching, and he taught out of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where we figure out or hear that we are all made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. That's God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, our let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock, over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him, created them. And then down in verse 31, it says, and God saw that all he had made and behold, it was very good, which is interesting because at the end of all the other creation days, he just looked at all that he had made, and it was good. But here, after having made all of mankind in his image, all of creation, he looked at, he had made, and he said it was very good. Now, what we see in this text, and we heard last week, is this simple truth, that people are never trash to God, always and only treasure. You are treasure to God. Not if, not when. You are treasure to God, period. This morning, we're going to look at something David wrote in Psalm 139. So if you're willing, take your copy of God's Word and look with me in Psalm 139. In this series, we will have been looking at Genesis and the Psalms, and next week in the Gospels, and then we're going to hear from the Apostle Paul, and then hear from the Apostle Peter. And all of these same writers, all throughout the Old and New Testament, say the same thing. You count. Everybody counts. You matter to God. Not if, not when, but you count Period. In Psalm 139, we read David's testimony about his understanding of how God created him. And this Psalm 139 is just explosive with all kinds of very rich language. We're going to hone in on just a few verses in the middle of Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18. And I will tell you this from the very beginning. We will only scratch the surface in here of the truths of the Word of God and this idea of how wonderfully made we are by our Creator, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 18, David says, For you created my inmost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my formless substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not even one of them. How precious also are your thoughts for me, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the sand. 
When I awake, I am still with you. This morning, I want us to take time to unpack a few words and phrases in each one of these verses I've just read. Because the language David uses is so rich. Really, to be honest with you, our English translations struggle with communicating the incredible and elaborate, intricate language David uses to describe how God creates human beings. And then after we go through some phrases and words in each verse, I think will be important to you. I know they are to me. I want to offer you an invitation. I want to invite you into something. And then I also want to share with you a a wild idea, just a wild idea that some of you will just, whether you do it outwardly or not, you will roll your eyes on the inside, just a wild idea. And then finally, I want to I wanna risk giving you a challenge. And I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that I don't know that everybody in the room or watching by live stream would be able to really step up to this challenge and maybe you're not ready for it and that's okay. But I'm going to offer, I'm going to take the risk of offering this challenge, extending this challenge to you. Let's look in verse 13. For you created my, in, my innermost parts. Now, by the way, the innermost parts there literally is the word for kidneys. If you've got the King James, you already know that. David says, you created my kidneys. I mean, you know, that's funny. I got to tell you, that's hilarious. If you don't find humor in the scriptures, then you're probably not. Well, I would stop there. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Literally, in that day and time, the idea of the kidneys was not just like the organs or the bowels or the inner physical parts, but had to do more with the inner part of the self where all the thoughts and feelings and ideas and came from. And so what David is talking about is that God created even that part of us, not just the physical that you could eventually touch or see on an MRI or in a CAT scan but, but, or have surgery on, but, but that which is in the internal part of the person. The deepest inner part of the being God created. And this idea of creating, he uses a word there that means to to, um, obtain or acquire by origination or fabrication. So if you've ever made something, like, you know, a meal or something or something in your wood shop or whatever, that you kind of crafted or fabricated or made something. In this case, in God's case, it would be out of like, like nothing, right? I mean, like, you know, he originated, he created, he fabricated, and there, there's this idea of ownership and pride that comes with ownership. When you create something, when you make something with your own hands, with your own abilities and skills, you, you feel a sense of pride. Maybe nobody else gets it. Maybe nobody else thinks it's important. Maybe nobody else thinks it's a value or it's pretty or whatever, but you do because you made it. You, you made it. It belongs to you. You, you, you own it. It's like, it's yours. David says that's how God thinks about him when he, he, he created his inmost beings. He, you wove me in my mother's womb, intricately intertwined with complexity. Gosh, the human body, the brain, the mind, the heart, all of it working together. The incredible neurological system is so complex, and God created all of that. Verse 14, I will give thanks to you. Because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. That awesomely word, you, you may have, in your text, it may say fearfully. And the idea is shock and awe. That is the idea that when we think about God's creation of the human being, there's this idea of this incredible, like, you know, amazing sense of uh, overwhelming kind of, like, surprise and shock that's there. I am fearfully, I am wonderfully, I am awesomely made. I, I think of, <laughs> I think of uh, the dad, uh, myself, standing and observing the birth of children, and I went full Gomer Pyle. I mean, I was like, shazam! I mean, it was amazing. And if you've ever been there, you understand this. It's just this overwhelming shock in all things. That's what David is talking about here. Wonderful are your works. Wonder, I'm wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That idea of extraordinary, unique distinct, set apart from all the others. And we know by our DNA, we know by our fingerprints, we know by all kinds of things in our physical body that there are no two human beings that have ever existed and will ever exist that are exactly 
the same. Identical twins may not be able to be told apart by other people. Maybe sometimes even their parents have to put a little label on a toe or something. But, but God knows each and every individual person uniquely, distinctly set apart. Extraordinary, wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. That soul, that deepest part of our soul. Wait, this is the part that when God reached down into the clay and the dust of the dirt in the Garden of Eden, and breathed into it the breath of life. It became a living being. It became a soul. It became that which we, from which we know very deeply in our lives this truth about God. Here's the thing. Our world has diluted all of this. Maybe those voices in your head, some of those bully voices that you and I listen to sometimes in our head kind of dilutes our idea. But deep in our gut, deep in our soul, when we really connect with God, we truly understand, like David did, that we are awesomely and wonderfully made. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. That word secret is the idea of covertness, co when I was made covertly. And the idea of covertly has within it the idea of intentionality, strategy involved. So my, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made covertly, secretly, with intention, with strategy. And skillfully formed in the depths of the earth, skillfully distinctly, with precision, with specificity. There are things about you, there are things like David, there are things about me that are unique and unlike any other human being on the planet, skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Verse 16, your eyes have seen my unformed or formless substance that literally is the word for embryo even from conception in embryonic stage God has seen us being formed and in your book were written recorded enrolled all the days that were ordained predetermined ahead of time for me when as yet there wasn't even one of them in existence Beloved, I don't know if you've ever been told or felt like you were treated like you were an accident. But in God's plans, there is not a human that has ever existed or will ever exist that in God's eyes is an accident. You count. Now, maybe you were a surprise to your parents. Maybe you were, quote, unplanned by your folks. But God has had a plan for your life from the point of conception on. Even before that was the plan. Even before there was yet even a day in the womb, God had a plan for your life. We tell our youngest kid that she was our surprise. We had a girl, boy, thought we were done. We've always told her she was our surprise, that we cannot imagine life without the blessing of Glenna, our youngest child. Child number one, child number two do not like it when we say that in front of them. But I don't know what that does to them. But I guess it's human nature that we feel like if somebody is raised up, that means we are diminished. But if we could just get beyond that as children of God, that just because God places value on somebody doesn't mean he devalues someone else. Somehow, someway, in this human experience, we think of this as a competition, and it's not. There's enough love. There's enough blessing. There's enough plan. There's enough of God's favor. Some people don't like it when I ask for God's favor. Listen, I ask for God's favor. I need God's favor. And people think, well, that means you're trying to be his favorite. No, it's a different thing. That's a human kind of idea. God has enough favor to go around for everybody and then some because his love, his favor is infinite. We don't need to treat it like it's finite and therefore only a little bit to go around. And if I get some extra, you get some less. That's not how it works with God. 
Well, I thought we were just going to go verse by verse. Pastor, I know you were going to preach. Okay. All right. Okay. Verse 16. Your eyes have seen my formless substance. In your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. There's this idea of intentionality in that verse. Strategy. Unique design for you. Your eyes have seen my formless substance. Your eyes have seen. Last week, Ryan talked about Hagar, the servant maid of Abraham, the mother by Abraham of Ishmael, who was rejected by Sarah and then an outcast into the desert. And she was running to hide. And she, when she ran from, she ran into God and discovered God thought she counted when nobody else did. And her praise to God was, you are the God who sees. Nathaniel in the Gospels, one of the earliest disciples to follow Jesus at his request, come follow me. Nathaniel in talking with Jesus at that calling, it seemed to him that maybe they had met before. Like Jesus was talking to like maybe Jesus knew him and he didn't ever remember meeting Jesus. So he brought that up to Jesus and Jesus said, oh, well, I saw you When you were under the fig tree. And Nathaniel experienced the truth. That our God is the God who sees us. David understood God to be the kind of God who sees us. Even before we were conceived in our mother's womb. Even as we were embryos growing in our mom's belly, God sees. He is the God who sees. Verse 17, how precious also are your thoughts for me, O God. How prized, how valuable, how highly esteemed are your thoughts, your ideas. And not just thoughts and ideas, but the word literally means purposes, aims, strategies for me. There's just so much intentionality in this passage you and I need to understand. How vast is the sum of them? Verse 18, were I to count them, if I were to take inventory, if I were to sit down and list them one at a time, your thoughts toward me, they would outnumber the sand. (laughs) Not, Not the collection of beaches on the earth and sand dunes and deserts like the Sahara on the earth, but each individual little grain of sand. You ever been to the beach? Tried to clean out your car after? (laughs) Months later, years later, you find sand in your car. You go to sell it to somebody. You had it detailed. They pick up a mat and they go, when'd you go to the beach? Well, about five years ago. Sand sticks too. It goes everywhere. It is innumerable. Such are the thoughts of God toward David. Such are the thoughts of God toward you. Such are the thoughts of God toward me. You count. Not if, not when. You count. Period. So David testifies. He exalts God about God's literal handiwork of creating him. And I want to ask you this question. Do you share... David's testimony about God's creation of you. This text is often, I think, rightly understood to be a testimony about God's creation of each and every human that has ever existed, exists now, and will ever exist, including you. Do you understand the incredible value God places on you as one he has created, acquired, obtained by origination? As his own. He 
If you don't or cannot share David's testimony about God's creation of you, then I wonder what's in the way. I wonder why that is. I wonder what's missing. I wonder what hurt needs to be healed. What flaw needs to be transformed? What voice you're listening to that is a bully voice in your head that you need to find somehow, some way, with God's help, the mute button for? I want to invite you into something this week. Here's the invitation. Would you spend some time reading this Verses 13 through 18, exclamation out loud to God. At least once every day this week. Would you stop and just read that out loud to God like David was writing it to God? Every day and see if you can't begin to pick up the testimony David had about how God has made you. Maybe you need to stand in front of a mirror and pray it out loud to God in the presence of the person who's in the mirror who needs to hear this. That's an invitation to you this week, every day. Maybe write it out in your own handwriting and read it back out loud while you're writing it out in your own handwriting. That's an invitation to you. Now, maybe that's a challenge for you. And that would be a challenge for you because maybe you are hung up on something Ryan talked about last week that I really want to emphasize again this week in that this really, this really speaks into our image of God. You and I, each of us have a particular picture of God or image of God or drawing of God in our head as to how we imagine God to be. And that, that, that picture, that image, that, that drawing of God in our minds is really put there by our life experiences the voices we've listened to our entire life. And because those primarily are human voices, they're they're going to be less than who God really is in reality. And so that our images of God need, need a little bit of like, I don't know, maybe even correction or improvement. The wonderful thing is our image of God, the picture we have of God in our mind, it it can be redrawn. There are places where we can even erase that are incorrect and maybe even fill in with some color. And so here's a wild idea. I mean, it's just wild. So if you want to all collectively roll your eyes at the same time, I'll give you a cue. What if this week you took some time to get out a piece of paper and some pens or colored pencils or crayons and color your image of God on paper? What who he is. I don't mean list his attributes. I mean drawing. Cut and paste some stuff. Put a collage together. Get creative. You're thinking, whew, that sounds childlike. All right. Grown up. Child of God. The kingdom is made of children. We have to come to him in childlike faith, Jesus said. Maybe you think it's too girly or too artsy. All right. Okay. Okay. Bubba, get some magic markers and do it on a big poster or something. Turn it manly if you need to. You see, those of us who work most of the time in our left brain and do all the analytical stuff and the lists of stuff and the attributes and all that sort of stuff, we need to get over in the other half of our brain that God also created in his image, that the creator of the universe created. I mean, God is artsy, guys. Look at the universe he's given us to experience. He's got a little bit of creativity, a little bit of color, a little bit of art there. Turn that loose. It's a wild idea. Let's give it a shot. And then I want to ask you this. Is there anyone whom you're struggling to think of as counting as much as other people? Maybe there's someone at work that just like, 
man, it would be a better place if they were to leave. Now, they're thinking of the same thing about you, but you know, you know what I'm saying, okay? All right? Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a mem- member of the extended family, and, you know, Walmart's already getting their Christmas stuff out, so you guys start thinking about the dinner table at Thanksgiving and Christmas. You're worried about that already. Maybe it's even somebody here at the church that just kind of rubs your fur backwards. You just wish at least they'd go to the other service. That'd be so good. So I'm going to take a, a risk in offer, challenging you with this idea. Do you need to consider a person or even a group of people and ask God to begin to show you the traits of his image they possess? You see, if everybody counts and everyone's made in God's image and everyone's created like David describes God creating humans here in Psalm 139, then even that person or even that type of group of people have the same kind of value to God that David did and that you do and I do. Now, they, they may be broken. They may be flawed. They may, they may still need a Savior and the eventual transformation of the work of God in their lives But will you look this way? No more than you and I need a Savior in the transformative work of God in our lives. We are all on a journey from being made in the likeness of God and falling into sin and ruining that being made in the likeness of God and then being redeemed by the Savior and now under the transformative work of God, being remade back into the image of Christ himself, the Son of God, to restore us and redeem us fully to where we're supposed to be. We're all on that journey. And maybe there's some people that aren't where you are on the journey, but they are still valuable to God redeemable by Christ who died for them as much as he died for you and for me. They just may not even know that yet, but they're valuable to God. Could you begin to ask God to show you traits of his image that they possess? Now, I said earlier that that challenge may not be for everybody And you may be thinking, I'm about to let you off the hook. I want you to know, I think that level of a challenge depends upon a healthy understanding of our value to God. And if you're still struggling with the first thing I mentioned, and you can't exalt God about his creation of you like David did, you don't share that testimony, then that's where you need to get your work done first. And maybe your image of God is not really a healthy place. I would invite you to that wild idea I suggested because really when it comes down to it, I don't think we can truly offer to others what we haven't discovered for ourselves. And our inability to offer value to other people who are different than we are and say that they count as much as everybody else and are just as valuable to God as everyone else, regardless, not if, not when, but period, then we probably need to realize that that speaks more about us than it does them. In fact, that's all it speaks is that we have work to do to understand our value to God. Jesus said we are to love God and love others like ourselves. And quite frankly, sometimes it would be a disaster to love others like we do ourselves. Because we don't love ourselves like God loves us. You count. Everybody counts. 
Not when, not if. Everybody counts. You count. Period. Let's pray. Would you take 60 seconds to speak with the Lord about what you've heard today? Would you let him speak to you about what he wants you to do about this message today? Listen to the Spirit of God.